All right, David Perret, Marine. Why is the military designed to keep people broke? Ooh. Well, if you think about it, it's not conducive for the military to... Like, if everybody joined the military, did four years, achieved financial freedom, and moved on with their life, there wouldn't really be much of a military. So, while they have all the resources available, they don't do a good job of pushing service members to the resources, or even often allowing them to go to the classes. A lot of units don't ever... If you, oh, I want to go to this class. And they're like, great, you have work to do. Um, there's that, but then there's almost this culture in the military of, like... I think it was more prevalent probably in like 2005, 2010, 15, but this like culture of, eh, I might die in combat, so why not, you know, go buy a Mustang at 30% interest? Why not, you know, go party? Why not? Like it's it's a bunch of, you call it alphas or whatever, like it's a bunch of dudes who beat their chest and want to one-up each other and they, they buy fancy toys and they go to the gun range and they do all these things and it doesn't have a good culture of financial, you know, Q, I guess. So, for, like, what's the first thing that I should do? Because you talked about, like, meeting, so, like, networking, meeting people, like, getting around the right people, right? Then you talk about paying off debt. Like, I don't have any excess money. Like, I, I have lots of debt. I'm not making, like, what should I do first? I think this is the biggest problem that people are facing right now. It's like, what do I do first? Okay, so, if you're a service member, I would say the VA loan. If you're not, I'd say an FHA loan. The so, loan. if I'm a service member, go buy a house with a VA loan. What would be my answer? I would say you buy like... Even a, if I'm in debt. If you can qualify for the loan, I would say you buy a fourplex. You live in one unit, you rent the other three out. So let's say you, you're in debt, but you have an apartment that costs you $2,000 a month. If I can get you into a fourplex where now you're only out of pocket $500 a month and you own the place, you're learning about real estate through action. You're learning how to be a landlord. You're learning about, you know, you're getting the tax benefits and the, the property value going up and all of that stuff. But most importantly, in your scenario, I just saved you $1,500 a month to pay off your debt with without you having yeah. to get an extra job. I think that, for me, is the first lever I try to pull with anyone. Because as long as your credit score, you know, the VA doesn't have a minimum requirement. Every bank does. But if you're over 640, easy. If you, I've seen as low as 520 get approved for a VA loan. And then if you get the seller to do a concession, they can do up to 4% of the purchase price back to cover closing costs and fees. Um, and if you have an agent or lender who understands that, it's easy to get that done. So you could literally be in zero dollars out of pocket to own a house, and you just cut your living expense by 75%. That's the fastest way to now pay off your debt. That's way better than getting another job and having no life. Or you can also ro roll your closing costs and the funding fee and all that stuff into the loan, right, for absolutely. a VA loan? Yeah. I, got, I did a VA loan one time. I, I, they paid me $1,000. So I paid for the appraisal, and like, I got $1,000 back for my loan somehow. I was like, I don't even know if this is legal. I mean, zero, literally zero out, out of pocket. And that house grew in equity. And that was a single family house that me and my family were living in. And it, I, it added $80,000 to my net worth when I sold it just two years later. And so, okay, a fourplex, I'm guessing or a duplex or a triplex. Or, yep. or even like if you're a, I think if you're like a single pilot or a single lieutenant, you get like a five bedroom house, you rent to four, four of your buddies yeah. rent rooms out. And now they all get to live somewhere a little bit cheaper you're living with your friends, and you're still saving all that money. So you can buy a single-family house and rent by the room. Absolutely. Yeah, for yeah. sure. I love that advice. That's fantastic. And then, so then my my rent, because what I would say, like, what I my answer probably would have been different. I would have been like, go make more money. Like, figure out how to do a side hustle and make more money. But I love this because they can do both. Absolutely. Like, because I always just look at Like, you have to increase your active income and then, or e decrease your expenses to pay off some of this debt. So you can do that. What if you're not a service member? You do the exact same thing with an FHA loan. It's only three and a half percent down. A very similar loan product. Um, or you could even do a conventional loan and put five percent down. Um, or I mean, if you if you just fix the whole property advice, then yeah, you could get a side hustle and you just spend maybe go bounce on the weekends at a bar or uh, you drive for Uber or Lyft or Uber Eats or whatever. You make a little bit extra money and you just you take that money and you earmark it for debt and you just pay your debt off as fast as possible. Because in most cases, let's say I got a credit card at 18% interest, could I earn a higher percent return than 18%? Yes, but 18% is a guaranteed return if you pay that credit card off, so why not get rid of it? Yeah. What, what do you think stopping people, people from going to do that? Like, everybody has the same 24 hours, so I've seen some people that are in debt and service members and non-service members that are out hustling 
and then others that aren't. Like, what's going on in the world right now where, like, people just feel don't feel like they have to go do that stuff? Like, why, why was stopping them? You know, the easy answer is education. Like, they're not aware of what to do, but I think that's a, uh, I think that's bullshit. I think the, the real answer is the people they surround themselves with. I think if you surround yourself with people that are all broke and they're all talking about how the system's rigged against them, they're all, you know, getting drunk on the weekend and, and, and doing nothing with their free time, playing Call of Duty and whatever, then that's what you're going to do. And if you're spending your time around people that have built businesses or, or in this case, just people who are house hacking and achieving, like buying real estate, then those people are inherently going to make better choices. It's like, the best example I could give you for this is if you went back 40 years and you worked out in the gym that Pumping Iron was filmed in with Arnold Schwarzenegger, if you went there every day and you were around Arnold and, and all those guys, you'd get bigger. Yep. If you wanted to get bigger and you never went to the gym once and you never interacted with anyone who was big, good luck. Like, So if you just surround yourself with the right people, which is why I always talk about community and and networking and, and local real estate meetups. And that's easy. You go, you go find a local real estate investor meetup. You go find a Facebook group. You go uh, create your own if there isn't one in the area. I've done that in three different cities. Or, or you just, you know, you just get on a forum like Bigger Pockets, Local Facebook group, Seven Figure Flipping, you know, Military Millionaire. There, there are communities with people like you in them. And so, you know, that kind of leads into, I, I've been telling people for a while now, like, you know, my number one piece of advice is to surround yourself with people that are already doing what you want to do, right? So if I'm interested in maybe owning a plane one day, why don't I go fly with Bill and learn a little bit about what it takes to own a plane? Um, you know, it's like people surround, people always take advice from people based on who has their best interest in heart, which is great. But, like, you know, I've, I've met your dad once, right? He wasn't an MMA fighter, to my knowledge. Oh. He probably loves you, but if you wanted to become an MMA fighter, he's not who you would go to. For sure. Right? You'd go to an MMA coach. Or Tell a, me not to do that. Yeah, you'd go to Ray Longo or, or Chris Weidman or these guys who succeeded in that arena. But for some reason, when we get into real estate investing, you know, if our if our mom or dad is like, oh, that's scary, you shouldn't do it, it's like, well, they love me, so they must be right. Well, they don't. what if they don't know anything about that arena? Like, I'd rather learn from you who's bought and sold millions of dollars in real estate. You know, so, so let's go back to that initial question. Let's say we have some desire to do something. Like the person watching, they're like, okay, I, I get it. Okay, fourplex, got it, duplex. I'm going to go do that. How do I get around the people that can give me some advice about some of those things? Like how do you find those people? You mentioned like some like online, but what if I want, I hear it all the time, like I want to get a mentor, I want somebody to follow. Like where do you recommend they go? Do they go like way up the ladder? Do they go a couple rungs up the ladder? And where do they find those people, and what do they say? So I'm, I'm a little different on this, I think, than some people, right? I don't, I've don't. i never had a mentor. I have a lot of mentors. And each mentor is for a specific thing, right? So, so where should they focus? And most of mine are relationship-oriented. So I, I would focus on finding people that are a little bit ahead of you and building genuine relationships with them. I think you've really got, like, three options when it comes to the mentor world, I think. I think you've got, I'm going to work for you for free, which is great. Like, if somebody, I'll, I'll say it this way, though. If you came to me and you're like, I want to work for you for free, I'm going to be like, great. But if you're like, hey, I noticed you have this problem. I can solve it for you. Let me do that. I'm much more inclined to help. Like, I don't want to figure out what i got to do for you if I don't know what your skill set is to, yeah, to work for free. It's just another to-do, right? Yeah. It's another to-do for So right. if you bring me some genuine skill you have or problem you can solve and you tackle it for me, you're in. Like, I'll, I'll help you. The other option is... You build really genuine relationships. So you find out where they are, you get close to them as a person, and then you're going to get relationship, like mentorship as a byproduct. So like a good example of that for me is uh, Brandon Turner. Like I've never paid Brandon Turner for mentorship. I've never been in a paid community with Brandon Turner for mentorship. I've never worked for Brandon for free. But I kept his car in my garage for four months when he was moving from Oahu to Maui, and I transported it to Maui for him. How, how did you how did you get connected in order to have his car in your garage? If you guys if you're watching this, and you don't know who Brandon Turner is. He's a was the uh, po- podcast host, Bigger Pockets podcast co-host for a while. Started his own podcast. Has grown in social media and real estate presence. And he's you know is one of the guys inside real estate who people want to get close to. Right place, right time. He he posted that he was doing a local meetup. Just one time, he was going to be in Oahu and he was going to go to a beach. And I wanted to meet him, so I showed up. Right, I took. So the you were there. You were stationed in Oahu. He wanted to. He was doing a meetup. You were following him at that time, as early on in his uh, career. 
I okay. showed up, and then, uh, you know, I, I said hi, I uh, d talked to him a little bit, built a little bit of a relationship, but I focused really on talking to, like, all the local people who I might actually be able to interact with, yep. and it just so happened that one of those guys was why Brandon was in town, a guy named Doug Nordman, old retired Navy submarine guy, financial wizard, I didn't know that at the time, and Doug invited me surfing, he's like, oh yeah, Brandon and I are going surfing Saturday, do you want to come? And I was like, yes, absolutely. So I showed up at the meetup. Then I got invited to surfing. I showed up at that. Then after surfing, Brandon invited me to lunch. I showed up at that. And so, I mean, I, the real answer is I just showed up. Yeah, but all this stuff is, it's really important. It seems like it's not a big deal, but it, all those dominoes line up. And absolutely. so one follow-up question I have for you is, let's say they were going surfing that day. What if you had something else planned? Like you had to work or you had a date or you had something else planned, what would you have done? Well, I would weigh which one is more important to me in the long run, and I would choose, so if so if, if it's something I can't get out of, like it, I'm stuck, it's it's the Marine Corps, there's no ifs, ands, or buts, I would have been like, unfortunately, that won't work for me, are you going again while you're here, or but, when's another opportunity? But let's say it's work? something like, that has a creative solution to it. Yeah. What well, would you I, would, I would find a way to show up in surfing. Because yeah. that's where I wanted to be, and that's who I wanted to be with. But that's that's what comes. I, I'm yeah. like, it's happened so many times for me. It's like it's it's not a can I make this work? It's how can I? Yeah. So can I find somebody to take my shift? And like, how many people will I call to take my shift? Because I know that this is important, and it might be my only shot at having building that relationship and getting to know that person. Yeah. Did, and then the next question I have is, did you go there with an agenda? And if so, what was it? Oh, actually. Uh, the agenda was to build a relationship. Okay. I don't. I don't know that I ever actually have asked Brandon for a favor, or or like had a an ask. I. I this phrase I use is uh, I don't want to be an ask hole. I don't want to go around and be like give me, give me, give me. A S K hole. A S K hole. I like that. Like I don't want to be a gimme 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 like take take take. People feel that energy. What I want is I want to be around people who are succeeding. Just build a relationship because naturally those people are going to want to invest in you once they see that you're worth a shit. So, if with Brandon, case in point, you know, it was just little baby steps to surround myself with him and not be a burden. Just be a friend, hang out, talk, bounce ideas back and forth. You know, if I knew he was in town, I'd invite him to coffee. And then ultimately what happened was he's a big surfer. And so, this is literally how my brand started. I don't know. This is, I've probably told this story a couple times, but... Uh, I knew he was a big surfer in Oahu. One of the best bases to surf or beaches to surf on is on the Marine Corps base. The only way to get on that base is via Marine Corps escort. Like you got to come with me. So I texted him and I was like, "Hey, I know you're in town for a week. You know, North Beach and Pyramid Beach are like two of the best surfing beaches on the entire island. They're right next to where you're staying. I can get you on if you want to come over for dinner. You can hang with the family. We'll go to the beach, watch the sunset, and all you got to do is like, I'll either pick you up or you can just drive in behind me and I can I can escort you through." So he came over for dinner. That night was, uh, we were talking. he was talking about writing books, and he said I should start a blog, and that was the start of my entire brand. That one conversation started everything. So it started the Military to Millionaire blog the in the beginning. Thing. That became the community, and now your War Room program and all that oh, stuff. Everything. Yep. So obviously that's, that was an important relationship to build. Yeah, so How long ago was that? Uh, that would have been... I first met him in 2017, and then that conversation was January of 18. Okay. So for you that are, that's watching, if you have a desire, there's probably somebody who's already achieved some level of success. I love what Dave said. Just a couple levels up. Like it's, I wouldn't go after the top dog. Like you're not, go, Don't go Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk. Be, like, be realistic in the beginning and work your way up, and then you get a little bit closer, a little bit closer. So you said that there's, one, there's one way you said to, to work for free you were talking about. And that kind of went into this, well, hey, you know, let me give you, I've never worked for free, I've never done these things, but I met this person. What are the other two ways? The, the building the relationship, like Brandon, okay. what we just talked about. And the third way, and this is the one no one wants to hear, and no one wants to talk about, and everyone gets all scared about, open your wallet. Yeah. If, if that person's so much further ahead, like Jeff Bezos, to your point, there is no way, well, we'll use a, a more close-to-home example. I live in Missouri, Johnny Morris. Bass Pro Shop is there. He's the founder yep. of Bass Pro. He's worth like $6 billion. And I've known a couple of people who've met him that love him, but I've known a couple of people who've met him and have just been like, wow, he's a real jerk. And I'm like, well, what did you talk to him about? Talk to him about? And it's like, oh, well, you know, I just said hi and this, that, and the other. And I'm like, that man makes like $150,000 an hour. If you're just saying hi to somebody who makes $150,000 an hour, like 
you've got to understand that his whole world is what's in this conversation for me. Like, you are costing me money right now. Yeah. So if you're talking about the weather, he doesn't care. So to most people, like, that comment that you just made to most people sounds, like, offensive. Yeah. They're like, wait, he doesn't have time for me? What's in it for me? No. Oh. But, I mean, probably a really nice guy, but understands, like, so many people are at him. So oh. what you have to understand is once you reach some level of success, everybody wants something from you. So, every, like, you are a target, you're an opportunity. Every conversation is, like, draining at that point, like, when you get to a level of success. Like, I can't even imagine how Taylor Swift walks around the planet. Like, it would be horrible, horrendous, to have that level of fame and fortune that everybody just want a picture, autograph, all this stuff. So, a lot of times, they just, like, want to be real human beings and real people. I've met a lot of really high net worth, high celebrity status folks in a room that was other people like that, and it's just like, they just want to be talked to like everybody else. Yeah, so you got, you got your three options. You find just a problem Johnny Morris has, and you fix it for him and work for him for free. You build a genuine relationship with him. If you find a hobby he's into or have a warm introduction or something, find a way to get close to him and build a relationship where you're not a leech. Or you pay him for his time. And that's, you know, people hear that and they're like, oh, scammers, gurus, whatever. If that guy's worth $150,000 an hour and you pay him 50, bu- 50 grand for an hour, he's still taking a pay cut to sit with you. Yeah. Like, yes, you had to pay him to get that information, but somebody like that is going to give you $50,000 worth of value. And so if people have the information that you're looking for and they're willing to part with it for a fee, then take, take advantage of that. Because most of these people won't do that. Like, he probably doesn't have a program, doesn't have a coaching program, doesn't have a, uh, you know, come join me for a quarter. Or, or a year. So, Russell Brunson, it, I've interviewed him in the plane. I encourage you to go back and watch the uh, the YouTube interview that I did with Russell and me flying. But Russell Brunson, one of the best marketers on the planet, and he launches a mastermind group for 50000 He's got a group, 150000 a year and $250,000 a year. And I was on an interview with a salesperson when he launched it. I wanted to get closer to Russell. I wanted to learn from him. I wanted to learn from all the people in his community. I want to be a part of his community. And... I was on there, and for $50,000, I was, I was on there to join his inner circle, 50000 And the guy said, your business qualifies to be in the next level group, 150000 a year. In two seconds, I was, like, I was like, what's the difference? He's like, well, there's 12 people in this one. There's 100 people in the other one. And this one has more proximity, closer to Russell. It, he, it's at his house, these kind of things. I was like, done. Yeah, I can get in there? He's like, yeah. I said, then I, my next question was, can I get into the $250,000 group? And he goes, no, you're not going to qualify for that one. And I said, okay, I'm in. And, and then I got to speak on a stage. We became friends. We messaged. We talk. I can send him a me- I'm helping him with a real estate deal right now. He comes in the airplane. And that took years. It took a couple years. And it took, you know, it took me paying to be in the right room to build the relationship. The money didn't build the relationship. The money got me in the room to build the relationship. And I think that's what a lot of people miss is, we, because we're conditioned to have free our whole lives. So like, in school, you have mentors. They're called teachers. In sports, you have mentors. They're called coaches. But guess what? All those teachers and all those coaches, they're paid. They're paid. They're just not paid by you. So other people are paying for them to mentor you, to coach you, to do all those things. So that's the difference. And, and now you finally realize you actually have to open up your wallet and, and make this payment. All right, so... All of these things, like, there's other things that you do, right? You've got a podcast, you built a community, things like that. Like, why, why would you do things like that? Like, how does that help somebody who's trying to grow? Like, your podcast specifically. I know we've talked about this in the past. Like, why did you start that? Yeah, the, the whole brand in general was just because I wanted to... just kind of came naturally. But the podcast... The podcast that I didn't... I didn't start a podcast originally. I started everything else. And when I was sitting there trying to figure out if I should start a podcast, what I realized was... There's another, I guess, another avenue that's a little bit sneakier and not necessarily the same, and that is, I realized if I if I wanted your time, I either need to bring you immense value, pay you for your time, or like I gotta earn that shit. And if I have a podcast that grows enough that it's mutually beneficial for you to come on the show because you're gonna get exposure, which is what a podcast is, you get exposure to my audience, I get exposure to your audience. It's it's great. It's a win-win. Well, I now have 45 minutes to ask you any question I would want to ask you in like a mentor session or anything I'd want to learn from on that podcast setting, and it doesn't feel like an ask because it's a podcast interview. It's it's showing my audience who you are to bring you value through my audience, and it's a win-win-win, and it's it's awesome. So it's it's funny because 
when people ask me if they should start a podcast, I bring you up as the example. Because I don't remember, uh, way back when my group was still really small, you commented on some random post on Facebook. And I was like, that sounds interesting. He knows something about real estate. And I don't even remember what it was. I just asked you about it. You told me a little bit. I was like, would you be on my podcast? And this was before you even owned Seven Figure Flipping. And so I got you on that podcast. Now you've been on the show three or four times. I've been, I've spoken at your event. You know, we ran an event together. Um, and none of that was intentional. It was just, wow, this guy sounds interesting. Let me on the show so I can ask him some questions. And uh, I even remember after that podcast, you stayed on for probably 15 minutes afterwards and coached me a little bit on, I don't, I don't know what it was at the time, but I mean, you stayed after the recording and we hung out for a little bit and that sat with me for a long time. So, yeah, I think that's, I think it's a big piece of it. Well, I love your, your idea of like, instead of like, what, what does my audience want in the beginning? It's like, what if I can start a podcast, I build a platform and then I can ask the questions from the mentor that I want the answer to. And I bet there's a lot of other people that want the same thing. So that would actually create really good content that other people want to listen to. And, awesome. and so it, it's great because a lot of people are like, oh, what should I talk about on this show? Like, well, just ask the questions that you want to ask. Like, what do you want to know about? And especially at the beginning as you're learning, it gives you a platform and a place to bring on people that you could get time for. But that's what I love about my kids' program. The kids' program is like, I'm getting people on Zoom calls that I want to learn stuff from and hang out with and build a relationship with because they just want to hang out and talk to the kids. But I could not get Russell Brunson on a one-hour Zoom call for me, like for our community, for me and my people. But when I said, hey, do you want to come spend time with kids that are like between 12 and 18 and we're like you know, teaching them financial independence and business ownership and stuff? And he's like, yeah, I'll do that for sure. Cool. When can we do it? And now like, you know, Donald Miller and uh, Nick Santanastasso and like so oh, many Nick's people awesome. that are – that I'm close to, that I have a relationship, Walter Bond, they're like, I will talk to the kids for sure. Whatever you need, I got you. It's cool, because then I get to, and all the parents get to listen over the shoulder of the kids. So that, that's one of the reasons why I built that, is to also build the relationships in the community that I want to build and my network. So, because you're right, like that opens doors, you know? And so, okay, somebody's watching this, they are like, you know, I don't know, trying to grow their financial independence, those kind of things. What is the best thing that you did? Like, what's the number one thing that you did that took you from, like, a net worth of very little to very high? Brand. Brand. Okay, go, why? Because, what does that mean? Like, yeah. brand is like, people say that, oh, I, what's your brand? I need a brand. Like, like I built a community of people that are interested in what I'm doing, invested in what I'm doing, want more information, follow me, you know, whatever. However you want to quantify it, what I built was, and this wasn't what I intended to do at the beginning, at the beginning, you know, when you go all the way back, it was I wanted to learn how to write, and then I just knew that I related to military people, and so what I would do is when people asked a bunch of questions about something, I'd just re do a lot of research, I'd write an article to answer those questions. And then that kind of just morphed over time to where I went from this new guy learning things and documenting what he's learning to the guy everybody goes to for VA loans or military benefits or, or VA loan, you know, house hacking, all that. But what I, what I accidentally built with the brand is the ability to raise money for deals, the ability to have people bring me deals, the ability to uh, bring people together and get a small piece of a deal, the ability to, like ultimately right now, if you took all my real estate away and left my brand or you took my brand away and left all my real estate, I would give you all my properties. And I would be like, you know what, it's so much easier to build now that I have this brand and this trust and this community and this followership. Like any problem that I have, somebody in that community can help me solve it. And because I just pour into it for free with YouTube and podcasts and whatever, they're willing to help. And then when it comes to like, I've got this deal that I need to raise a million dollars for for a hotel we just bought in Tennessee, I end up raising 1.3 and then bringing another investor in who brought 1.5. Like, we closed almost the entire raise out of four of my friends and three of them are in my community. And that was just a byproduct of years of building trust in that community. Okay, so your brand, like, this word is, to me, like, the last year I've been spent spending my time doing this. And so I remember in the beginning of this going, man, I even have an email list. I have a podcast. I have all this stuff. And i like, but... I was so attached to the company. I was like, I, I, I'm like, I'm building the company and the company's kind of building me, but we're, neither one of us is like, stand on our own. And so I had to like, brand myself. So how do you explain what, you, what your brand is in one sentence? 
Can you, like, what is it? Help service members and vets achieve financial freedom. Okay, if you just heard that and you're watching this, like, that's it. You have to figure out exactly what you do. I help service members and vets achieve financial freedom. So that's what it is. It's like, who do you serve and what's the outcome that you're giving those people? That's it. Like, and so, like, when I look at Seven Figure Flipping, my real estate company, it's like, we help real estate investors achieve financial freedom. So it's like, and so I can hit, like, real estate investors across the board, wholesalers, flippers, landlords, you know, Airbnb, short-term rental, even land flippers. Like, we help them systemize and build their business to create financial freedom in a business that they don't have to run themselves. Like, they're not all doing all the work, the systemizing and operating that stuff. So you've got that, like, understand what that company does. So now all the conversation and talk tracks can lead to that. So even myself, like, you know, you're watching this on YouTube or you're watching a short on Instagram or TikTok or YouTube shorts. And so for me, we've gone all in on the aviation the last year because it, like, what I want to be known for is aviation money and business and then real estate too. So in the beginning, like, most people that love airplanes, they, they, they're they interested in, in having a high net worth and making a lot of money. So if you're interested in making a lot of money, I can help consult in your business. I can help consult in your real estate company. Like, I love doing, I love talking about money, helping people make money. And so it helps me raise money, helps me find deals. And that's like the top of, like, that hits the broadest audience for me. It's aviation, my background as a test pilot. And I get to, ha like, bring cool people in the plane and do what I loved. Like, I would do this for free. I pay to do this. Like, I, I have to pay a lot of money to fly this airplane. And so, and, and then to edit this video and chop it up and cut it and all those things. But, you know, in the end, long run, it's going to pay off with, like you said, you have to build a platform and it takes time. How long did that take to build the platform? And it was... I was screwing around with it from 2018 to 2020. 2020 was when I realized I actually had something. And then, I mean, it's it's been a journey, but 21 to 24 is when it's really grown. So, you know, we went from, probably in that last three years, I went from 15,000 people on Facebook group to almost 70,000. I went from 10,000 on TikTok to 100. I went from, I was probably, three years ago, I was probably at like 20,000 on Instagram, and now I'm at just about 60. Uh, YouTube, we're probably up 20,000, 25,000. We're at 38 right now. Uh, you know, but more importantly, until 2020, 2021, I didn't really have a monetization strategy. I mean, I, I launched the, the mastermind community in 2019, but it was like really cheap, not really well marketed, kind of just out there. And then it became an actual business model in like 21. I started doing referrals. I started doing the community. I started actually, I wrote the book in 21. Um, and I started actually bringing in money and treating it like a business, and that's when it started to take off. What's the book called? No BS Guide to Military Life. Love it. Where can I get that? Uh, you can go to my website, and you can get it for free, or you what can go it? to Amazon. Uh, from military to millionaire .com. Okay, cool. From military to millionaire .com. We'll put cool. that. Actually, there. if you go to the best podcast guest dot com, it takes you right to the free book landing page. Oh, nice. The best podcast guest dot com. <laughs> nice. All right. <laughs> so I bought that domain. Cool. Um, all right, so like inside of that, in that brand, um, you mentioned you didn't have a monetization strategy for the first few years. Do you think that was a good idea or a bad idea? I think it was because it was just a passion project at the time. It wasn't something I was really treating out. I think there's some value to building traction um, and being just you know documenting and being real and whatever. Uh, but I definitely could have monetized early without ruining that. So I could have started an, an investor list and raising capital early on, and that would not have tainted anything. I think if I come out the gate as brand new investors starting to build a brand, I've got 200 followers on Instagram and I'm like, buy my course, that's totally bogus. Um, I think if I'm, you know, if I build that brand, but while I'm doing it, I'm like, hey, this is what I'm doing. These are the kind of deals I'm doing. These are the kinds of returns I'm doing. If you want to join along, you know, get on my newsletter. I absolutely should have had a newsletter, an email list earlier. Um, I should have I should have started a fu like actually raising money or, or saying if you want to invest with us, get on here. So turning turning that traffic that's just watching into traffic you own. So traffic that you're renting to traffic yeah. that you own. Yeah. So like building an email list, getting a you know email contact opt-ins, those kind of things. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I actually really like the idea of in the beginning like no ask. So like I actually think that you, it sounds like you were like oh man I I really didn't have a monetization strategy, but in the beginning like I really think adding the value is really important. Like, how do you build, how do you just give and give and give? 
before the ask. I've seen many people do it the other way around. And yeah, it makes some money, but like really, how much can you give? And then people like get really hungry and ravenous for something that you have to offer. And then you can just like blow it out of the water. I saw yeah. Mark Rober, I, he, I, like the best I've ever seen. He builds this incredible YouTube channel, has a huge following. And then they drop the Crunch Lab box and it, it makes, you know, tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars on day one. Because the amount of like build up and, and, and like just he's given so much value to people. They've loved everything. It just sold like crazy right out of the gate. Mr. Beast is another great example. For sure. But like, these guys are also like two in, two in a billion. Yeah, yeah. So like the, I've seen it in smaller scale as well. So if you're watching, it's like, oh, yeah, everybody wants to be the next Mr. Beast. Everyone wants to be the next Mark Rober. But really, like, what, what I've been doing is I've been trying to build relationships here in the cockpit, adding value to YouTube, social media. And, and now pe even people I know, they're like, oh, my gosh, I see your videos everywhere. Like, you've really kind of stepped up this game. But I've, I've gotten the chance to interview, like, really cool people and build relationships with really cool people that I wouldn't have an opportunity to do. Because if you get asked to come on a podcast, like, yeah, I'll go on your podcast. But it's like, hey, I do something a little different. Like, we actually fly an airplane. Like George Campbell. George Campbell is uh, one of Dave, the Dave Ramsey personalities. He came in the airplane. Oh, it was that was a good opportunity for me to meet somebody in Nashville. He's right down the road from me. And we have different beliefs on a lot of things. But like, I probably wouldn't have that opportunity. We just had a basic podcast, you know. And eventually, him getting Dave Ramsey to come in and fly with me is, is he's on my list. And I just make a list of people. It's like, you know, you reach out to them, and it opens the door. So. There's some things that I would recommend for anybody watching. It's definitely, even at a small scale, don't, don't be overwhelmed by that word brand. Just figure out what you'd love to do. What would you do for free? What are you best at? And what would you talk about for hours and hours and hours if they gave you the microphone? I mean, it could be video games. It could be aviation. It could be money. It could be real estate. It could be soccer. It could be football. It could be so many things. And you just figure out how, you, what are you known for? You know, and what are you interested in? I tell this to my ki the kids all the time, the kids in the program. Like, if you love baseball cards, go flip baseball cards. If you oh. love, you know, shoes, go flip Nikes or whatever shoes. Like, I don't know, uh, Yeezys or whatever is cool right now. I have no idea. <laughs> I don't think those are cool anymore. But There are videos where I'm wearing a blonde wig or I'm pretending to be this or pretending to be that. Or I just try to add in. You know, I think I get away with that because I'm, in, I'm a military niche. And so I can make fun of service members and they laugh about it. Or I can make fun of other professions and they laugh about it. Like, my audience loves that authentic, blunt, ha-ha-ha, make fun of people, talk smack, whatever. And so if I can wrap a very simple educational concept into something funny like that or a weird dialogue just to keep their attention, it does actually get a lot better and a lot, a lot better response because otherwise, like, you're right. Education's not always what people want to sit and watch on YouTube. That's not, I'll tell you what, what I see with that is you'll attract the people that, like, enjoy that and want to be a part of that. Those are also the people that you want to spend time with and hang out with. They're people that, like, that like you, get you. And then other people will be like, this guy's an idiot. And they're, they're gone. So it's the magnetic marketing piece of it. It's the polarizing side where one side of the magnet pulls somebody in and you turn it around and it pushes somebody away. So I see, I, like, we try to do a lot of stuff on my social for a while. That was, like, they were trying to get me to do it, but it just wasn't me. Like, I was like... Okay, we didn't see a lot of traction because it wasn't me, and I, I couldn't get behind it. It wasn't. It was not authentically me. It was obvious. Even just like the colors and the structure and the the flow and the wording and things like that. It's just like this is not me. Like I'm not proud of what we're putting out right now, and it was obvious. And now we're doing stuff that I like to do. I'm like, yeah, heck yeah, I'll watch a helicopter crash and react to it. I'll interview somebody in front of the aircraft. I'll you know I'll go out flying and and do an interview with somebody and just talk, you know, and if people watch it, great. And uh, so I think being authentically you is the key. So many people are trying to, like, to, like create Mr. Beast videos that aren't Mr. Beast. They're trying to create Mark Rober videos that aren't Mark Rober. The, the, the big thing is we're not comfortable in our own skin. So if we can get more comfortable in our own skin and just put that out there, then and, and we have to be okay when a lot of people aren't watching it in the beginning, you know, and eventually you'll start seeing... Well, it's interesting, but Val, to your point, I think that people want to be entertained on social media. That's it. They come there for the entertainment. They come there for the drama. you got to understand that it's a reality TV show. Like, Instagram is a reality TV show. So if you're creating a reality TV show, you got to give somebody some reality TV. Right. YouTube is very much an educational-type platform 
But like when I create the best value video, we were talking about this yesterday, the most valuable video I've ever created gets a, a tiny number of views. Like there's so much content in there that people have paid me $50,000 a year to get. I'll make that video. It'll get 50 views. And then I'll make some random video about, I don't know, some airplane crashing. You'll get like a million views. And so people just want to be numbed. But the way I look at it is you've got to create the top of funnel stuff. That you've got to create that, that, edu that, that uh, entertaining type stuff in your own way to bring people in that then will funnel down to the, to the video that you make that gets, you know, instead of getting 50 views, then when you have a bigger following, it gets 1,000 views. And then you have a bigger following, it gets 10,000 views. And that video is designed to convert somebody into your world and, and monetize. So, Dave, you uh, recently went through a divorce, and I see that happen, you know, obviously there's lots of factors involved, but a lot of entrepreneurs and business owners, and especially military people, they, it's very stressful in the family and the home. My wife asked me for a divorce in 2020, and went through like really challenging, really difficult time with that myself. And a lot of it was just kind of like me, not, not being there like in, in the business side of things for mine. I'm curious for you, like how, how is it running a business and especially like the military, both of those, how are they with family, with relationships, that kind of stuff. And what can people kind of think about in that? You just have to prioritize, right? And so I actually don't think that my business I don't think spending time on my business is what caused the divorce. I think, realistically, we grew apart because when I got married, we weren't doing any of this. And I continued to grow and increase and do bigger things and whatever. And she didn't, didn't read books, wasn't interested in personal development, didn't grow with, didn't, you know, over time decided she didn't really like the business. Like, there was just um, a lot of different stuff like that that, came up that I think kind of drove us apart but a, a big piece is you know my last year and a half I was in the military she had moved back early to Missouri where we were planning to go back to and I was still active duty doing my thing plus the business plus whatever so like that time by the time I finally got back like she had already kind of just it was, it was it was done I think in her mind you know she was, wasn't really ready to fight for anything like that distance was hard and that's no different than a deployment you know, you go away for a year and you come back and it's like a whole lot of stuff has changed without you. So that's something I see. I see a lot of entrepreneurs. You know, I noticed when things got worse, a lot of times I would want to like bury my head at work instead yeah. of going to confront the problem because home wasn't peaceful for me. Home wasn't a place I could relax. And, um, you know, but then interestingly enough, during the summer of the year before we got divorced, I was taking two days a week off plus Saturday, Sunday. So I was taking four out of seven days out. And I basically got told, hey, uh, you should go back to work. <laughs> like, so it, I don't think it was a lack of time so much of a, you know, we grew apart over some things and then it just was, we became incompatible. Um, but I'll tell you, man, that was, that wreaked havoc on my business. I mean, I was not focused at all there. I wasn't focused on friendship. I mean, there was just a lot of stuff I let go. I let go of, of a lot of fitness stuff. I let go of a lot of like business stuff. I was just not I was not all in anywhere. I tried to be all in at home, but, you know, it was just everything took a toll. And uh, so as much as I don't like divorce and I don't recommend it for anyone, um, I, I can definitely tell you that I'm in a much better space emotionally and, and everything else right now than I was that last year or two because, you know, unfortunately it takes two hands to clap. Yeah, so, uh, you know, for me, I, I've seen the same thing. I, like, buried my head in business. I... I go there a lot when, when things are difficult in other places, because it's like an easy place for me to to get all of my human needs met, you know. Um, so the, these Tony Robbins six human needs, if you're watching and haven't heard of it, is a phenomenal concept, and um, and all all my needs get met there. And so it's really easy to go there and not confront those problems. In the military, we were told to like uh, compartmentalize and push everything down and not go through it. Uh, the biggest piece of advice I can give to anybody going through a hard time is to go through it and uh, and actually like feel the pain. And It's okay to hurt. It's okay to be in pain. What is some advice you would give to somebody who um, is like their spouse has no desire to be in the business at all, is not interested? Like Because mine is like that. And so um, is there things that you've seen, whether it's with you or somebody else, of like how that can work? Because for me, it's very much just like, I can't bring the work and business home. Like, my wife has no interest in it. She's also not a personal development person. Like, my wife is not 
you know, reading books and growing and things like that. She would, she'd love to just kind of sit on a beach or relax or, you know, take a, just be alone at a movie theater. I'm like, I don't even know how you do that. So any advice that you could give there or some, uh, some things that you've seen in the past, even that haven't worked? I mean, I would say getting on the same page and I would, you know, I would say really just managing expectations. Like it's okay. You know, I would have been totally okay if she wanted nothing to do with the business at all. If I had been able to like come home and home was peaceful. Like I didn't mind like for a long time. It was, she wasn't really interested in the business. Our relationship was good. It was when she started to like resent me anything I was doing on the business that we started to grow apart because I'm like, you know, so like, I guess what I would say with that is like, they don't need to be involved in the business at all if they're supportive of you. If you could do something different, what would you have done? Do you think? Uh, honestly, that's a really hard question to answer because I feel like I tried everything I possibly, like, I don't know. But yeah. the hardest part for me on all this is, she went, I don't want to say full narcissist, but that's, I mean, it is what it is, but like, she wouldn't give me feedback. Would, everything was wrong, everything was gaslit, everything was whatever. She, I don't have any answers. Like, I, I have dug, I've asked, I've yeah. we went to counseling. Like, I don't know where it went wrong because she never gave me anything. At one point, she gave me, like, a laundry list, but it was like, you know, you folded the laundry wrong. Like, not really, but it was like the laundry list of things was like, there's, no, that's not, that, that, no. Yeah, you know? not a big deal. So what I see is, is like, what I saw in my relationship is like one degree apart for a long period of time yeah. made it really hard to come back together. Yeah. Like everything basically had to just be broken down and burned to the ground and just see if we could stay together still standing there. And I think a lot of relationships can't, that, that doesn't happen in. And very few, like both parties are willing to come back to the table, which we were. So I see it totally, like I've seen it happen. And that's the biggest piece of advice to give to anybody watching is don't let things get too far apart for too long. Because I basically felt like I, was, I had a roommate when I woke up. And I was like, how did, the, how did I even get here? I didn't know. And it's really hard to recover from. So make that correction. Dive in right away. All right, Dave. What's something that you've never shared on a podcast before? And usually I preface this with, you know, you're going to land the plane. So something could happen, I don't know, during the landing. And you might want to tell this story before... You know, you can't tell it again. So, what is, to give me a story, give me some dirt, something that you've never told anyone, hasn't been on a show before, that they can only hear right here on our channel. I, I don't know if this is the most juicy thing ever, but uh, my, like, personal development journey coming out of the divorce, right, one of the things I did was uh, a mushroom ceremony, which, you, you know, people are like, what's a mushroom ceremony? Well, it's where I had a guide and I took four grams of psilocybin mushrooms and I went and had a total trip for like I mean the trip itself was probably like two three hours but then like an hour prior to that walking through the woods doing whatever um you know because I'd heard good things and you know being military we don't ever do anything drug related whatever right yep. and I, I had microdosed a little bit after the military oh and I should probably put this on while I'm talking yeah I love it when I put my seatbelt on and I thought you were gonna freak out and be like oh my gosh I'm late I gotta put mine on <laughs> yeah, you got some time. Yeah, it's all good. Um, so in that, right, like, it's a very interesting experience. I don't know if you've ever done that. And oh. A lot of people haven't, but, like, the first, like, hour and a half or two of, of trip is, like, everything you should already believe about yourself, it's almost like every compliment you've ever heard, everything anyone's ever pointed out that you're good at, anything you should believe about yourself, and you're telling yourself those things and believing it. So I was like, like laying there and I'm like hearing myself be like, you are loved, you are worthy, you are great at this, you're good at this, you're incredible at this, you're doing right here, you're, you know, all this stuff. And then like the last half was like me curled up in the fetal position, like sobbing into a pillow about, <laughs> about thinking through like how the divorce was going to affect my son. And really just prioritizing the fact that I needed to spend time being a dad, being a father, and how that was going to look, because you know, I was terrified about, you know, the idea that it, what I told myself is like, well, obviously if this marriage isn't going to work, like, he deserves to know what a healthy relationship looks like, so I, I need to move on. Um, the reality of that is, like, I know what divorce does 
all have we all have friends with stories or some of us personally have stories of like be the kid who grew up without parents and and whatever that looks like and so it was a it was a really intense uh, you know hour and a half or so of just really driving that point home to be a good dad um, and to really try to focus my efforts there because like man that poor kid you know I mean I <laughs> I still kind of choke up thinking about it but it was like I mean it was a gut check for sure it's like I, I was thinking I was gonna have to like come to terms with all these demons from the marriage and that didn't come up at all it was just that it was just what's gonna happen with him going through this how do I avoid that being a uh, a negative thing that impacts him for the rest of his life. Yeah. Wow. What uh, What would you recommend? Would you recommend that something? Do, some people that are watching doing something like that. I tell you this. Um, I won't. I won't make a recommendation for somebody because you know. I think. I'll tell you this. Psychedelics aren't addictive. If you do them in a safe situation, you know, a safe environment with the right people guiding over you, the worst case scenario realistically is is a bad trip, which is very rare. And it's if you go in with like bad intentions behind or like you're not asking the right questions you gotta have like a clear head and be in a good mental space to do this um but so rather than recommending i'll just say this my goals for the year include at least one psychedelic journey and i'll do that again next year and i'll probably do it again the following year and you know i'd like to try a couple different types but the mushroom ceremony was uh it was a really really profound and, and valuable experience for me it really helped me with everything I was dealing with at the time, so yeah. All right, you ready to land the plane? Yeah. After the mushroom trip. Are you on mushrooms right now? <laughs> no. Okay, cool. I just want to make sure before Most I let you... No substances, but water and, uh, and tacos. Before I let you land the plane. The airport's right there. You see it? I do. Cool. All right, Dave. Hey, how can other people find out more information about you? Where should they go to follow you, to check you out, uh, and where should they go? bestpodcastguest.com it's got a link to my free book and all my social media platforms okay where do you hang out the most on social media Ooh, if you want to get a hold of me directly Instagram Instagram and you're where what platforms all at from military to millionaire okay at from millionaire military to millionaire is that T-O or the number two? Oh. T-O cool yep alright there you go Dave thanks for being on the show man